Christian communities. Um, I've, I've con in usually spiritually. I've lived in ashrams temporarily. Um, I've been on land where I educate and teach about, you know, farming and core food production and microbial mass. And what I find is a lot of people want to go to communities and live because they want to go there because there's, they, they feel like if they can go to a community, they don't have to do anything. They can just fully check out and somebody else will like, you know, maybe the food, like something magical will happen and the food will come up and they'll have food to eat. But usually what happens is whoever is leading the community ends up responsible for these people and having to feed them and because they're not being part of a collective system. They're so overwhelmed with their Stockholm syndrome that they don't know what else to do. So they, instead of taking personal responsibility for their lives and their thoughts and their actions and trying to drive their life forward, you know, into the future from the present moment, they actually go somewhere else where they can fully check out and escape um, their fate, basically instead of being proactive about moving their personal feet forward, however that's going to, you know, manifest into the future. Yeah. So there's got to be this point where we um, not wake up, but we decide that in the present moment, I have. You know, we're going to develop, you know, um, a future for ourselves. And this is the deal is individually, it's all going to be different. I have a framework for it. Going to be all unique. Huh? I have a framework for what you're talking about. <laughs> That's what I've been working with. And I think it's all come together that if we as sovereigns become stewards of living earth, and we represent the earth as a being that needs to be addressed as another being. And if it's not ours, we can't take it. We can change the basis of how we construct the rules of the game and do it from human scale. So that what we follow as an idea is based on what our heart tells us to follow and we do it in a way where we observe, make agreements, but that no matter what the agreement is, we make sure that it's working for all humans involved in the agreement with a sign-off. Now, you you want to continue talking, or do you want to take another uh, comment from the from the clubhouse? house sounds fine and the other thing too is like we have to most of the land okay and, and Lenny's land falls into this category it's run by you know a person that is not mentally okay who is you know a tyrant um and so most of the land you know if we moved out onto the land most of the land that the biggest thing is how do we figure out how to get large scale pieces of land where we can actually go in and steward them, right? That are not owned by control mechanisms. So it doesn't matter whether we have an agreement or not. All the what land right is now controlled. Is we, need, we need land to start, you know, working these types of, um, you know, thought processes of stewarding land and taking care of land so that other people can see what we're doing and then be able to broadcast that, you know. There, into was, there was a model that was already out there. It's called co-op communities. Now, co-op communities have been around for a very long time. And you know, when people come together in a community, in a co-op community, everybody has a responsibility when they're in that community to really help out with a lot of different things like yard work, cleaning up trash and other things like that. I know because I was in a co-op community for a little bit when I was younger. And you know what, those communities are, have been dying out because people just don't want to live in those communities because they want everything handed to them. Now, these right. communities are, are pretty good, 
because it does get everybody that's living in these communities involved with keeping these communities in a proper state. Right. So my experience with co-opt communities and being asked to go in in the summers, that's usually what I do is I go to land people that want to build communities or already have communities and I help them to build like poor food production, microbial mass, kind of work together. And it's, that's exactly what I find is that nobody really wants to work together. And a lot of times people get kicked off the communities because they don't want to do their part. You know, they don't want to do their four hours. And in the beginning, when you're building these communities, you're looking at 12 hour work days, you know, seven days a week, um, just to get, you know, food production up and going um, for like five years uh, so that you have enough food to feed everybody in those on your community, right? So that you don't have to bring anything else in, uh, yeah, which means I'm that you don't have to. Speaking more on like inside cities, like big cities, co-op communities. Well, this is the problem now, but you're going to have, right, but you're going to have 5G. So 5G right now, um, one of the people that I have on my show, Mark Steele, he's a military, you know, a microwave weapons expert. And we have 5G right now, which is a genocidal weapon. And places where it's gone up in cities, it's already killing people, like rapidly, especially children, animals, birds are completely gone. So, when, yeah, there, were, you know, there was an article about some kids in a school somewhere in the state where uh, kids were contracting cancer in school. There was like six different kids that have contracted cancer. And there was a mm -hmm. five right close to the school. Right. So in, in, in America, you know, in all, every school lot, there is a Wi-Fi tower. Um, it's, been here here for, it's been here for like two years now. Yeah. And so the thing is, is that, you know, obviously co-op communities don't work if you don't have insects and birds. You know, they don't work if, you know, all the people are sick in them. I mean, that's, you know, that would be like an afterthought. And this is the other thing, too, is um, there was a huge, like here in the Reno area, there was a huge push. People wanted to have community gardens all over. So the city of Reno was pushed into, um, so I get a call from Volunteers of America saying, hey, look, um, the city of Reno has put out a job, um, community garden leader, and this would be your job, you know, to build community gardens and get them built up and then get the community functioning in them and, you know, seed sharing and all this other stuff. I was like, great. I'm probably one of the only people in this area that has, you know, the credentials and the experience because I've been building urban food productions in people's backyards, you know, for like 10 years, blah, 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 biodynamic farming certification, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Travel to different lands and environments and been building this stuff. So I start tracking it down and there's like a, and this is, this is the part where, you know, it's our, it comes back to our responsibility. So I'm thinking, you know, I would really like to actually have a job. I'd really like to get out of my van. I'd really like to stop you know, being homeless um, and actually, you know, have an income doing exactly what I want to do. But there's always a scam component with these turd muffins, you know, and there, it's always some kind of scam and we're relying on them to help us to put things together. So I end up calling all over the city of Reno, trying to figure out where this job description is, where I can find the application. I spent like a week trying to, you know, track this job down and who I'm going to contact. Well, I end up having to contact this woman who's like the head horticulturist for the city of Reno. So I end up, you know, calling her like five or six times, leaving her long, you know, um, long um, voicemail saying, could you please get back to me? I'd like to know where the application is. You know, I have way more than you guys need. This is exactly kind of what I've been looking for in my area to try to put into, you know, the city and the community and start working with the community, you know, blah, 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 where I've lived pretty much often on my whole life. 
And so somebody calls me, not this woman, right? Who is the person that's supposed to be doing the hiring for this position, leader for, you know, the head leader for um, properties uh, and parks that the city of Reno um, owns and has authority over to put in community gardens in all these different areas, right? So I get this call from somebody I don't even know, and they said, well, we just kind of, um, we know that you've been calling around, and we know that you know you're overqualified for this job, but we need to let you know that there isn't this job. I said, excuse me? And they said, well, because of pressure from the community, uh, we were forced to do some PR work and put out this job, but there really is no job. And I was like, um, I don't really understand. And they said, well, there isn't a job. We're not going to give out applications for somebody to fill this job position. This was a PR thing so that these people would get off of our backs. We have no intention of actually hiring somebody. And the city of Reno has no intentions of actually creating community gardens. I was like, wow. I mean, you know, that's as blatant as it gets. So it goes back to, you know, us trying to figure out what it is that we want to do, aspire towards that in our, our daily lives and head towards it, um, being the solution, not being part of the problem, but being part of the solution, at least in our own life. And I know that, you know, working in communities sometimes is not easy. I mean, obviously I'm not living on one. Um, you know, if I would have found like the perfect ideal community, I'd still be there. Um, you would never be hearing from me on radio. I wouldn't have websites. I wouldn't be working with people anymore. I would be 100% on that community, um, building it um, for the future. But because communities are not ideal um, and we're waiting, you know, for something to help us. Um, we're not actually getting the work done, you know, within our lifetime, and we're not really being able to change it. So therefore, it's it's going to be worse down the road. And so it comes, you know, to the choices of, um, and you know, living on a community or living the kind of life that I live um, has even taken time for me. You know, living out of my van. Um, I, you know, get places to stay on the floor during the winter. Um, I've been living pretty much out of my van since 2006. It's pretty tough. They, you know, they want to, if you're sleeping in your van on the roads in the city and stuff like that, they will try to arrest you and take, you know, what you own. Um, and, you know, then in the summer times, you know, I live on land out of my van, you know, trying to help out. Um, and then see if it's going to be a match or not. And, you know, if not, then I, you know, I'll come back to Reno. Um, but it, it's not, um, it's not an ideal lifestyle. I mean, it's a very difficult lifestyle. I think it's a very difficult lifestyle, not really knowing, you know, where you're going to be tomorrow or where you're going to be like next month or um, sometimes even, you know, like how you're going to eat um, in 2008. I was in Taos, New Mexico, and uh, I was um, having, you know, I had to quit this job that I had gotten part-time. I had gone to Taos, New Mexico because I was supposed to be working in this community. I got hired by a nonprofit. I was going to be building um, some framework for uh, some community staff. Uh, it's where I met Keith McHenry, who is one of the founders of Food Not Bombs. And then I ended up starting working with him on International World Peace Conference in Taos, New Mexico. Um, but because the nonprofit wasn't paying me, they kind of lied when they put out the job. You know, I was like stuck in Taos. So um, I was, when I had to actually... Um, eat out of a dumpster, you know, and it was on my 40th birthday. So um, this lifestyle is tough, you know, like you have to really, um, you know, check your life expectations, your expectations, you know, in at the door. Life and it's not a lifestyle. Life is what you make it, right? It is. And, you know, 
Yeah, and I don't mind my lifestyle, but a lot of the people in my life don't like my lifestyle. And I have a lot of friends who won't talk to me anymore because they don't really appreciate where I'm at and that they feel like I'm not even trying. Um, and they don't realize, like, you know, um, that I probably work more hours than most people, but I don't get paid for a lot of those hours. Um, like, being on, you know, many show or having my own radio show. I mean, I probably end up spending 30 hours a week on radio, um, you know, trying to talk about experience and stuff like that that I don't get paid for. So, you know, my work weeks can be like, you know, 90 hours um, if I'm working on projects for people that I'm not getting paid for, you know, even more. And I don't mind that. I'd rather spend... Why don't you look at finding communities that are uh, connected to the Ubuntu movement? Lenny knows Right. I mean, those don't, I mean, the thing is, is that we don't have communities in the United States. They don't work really well. A lot of here in Canada. Right. So the thing is, is like, for example, I lived in an ashram in 2004 for about six months. Um, and the problem is, is that there's a hierarchy in the ashrams as well. Um, and they're not suited for like individual growth. Um, they also, um, if you come in on the low end, um, things can be really difficult for you. And in some cases in these communities, you can be more enslaved than you were in the outside world. Um, and the communities don't really care a lot about what you bring to the community. Um, and if you bring a lot to the community, they want to figure out how to get rid of you. Um, especially like if you're an overachiever and you're moving things forward, um, sometimes the communities don't really like that. Uh, so, uh, uh, that. That just seems like very, very negative thinking in, uh, in that, in that sense, because, you know, if, if you can actually, you know, get to people like Lenny says on the human scale and speak to them about this, even to one person, you know, you can, you can really make a difference as if you start bringing this stuff to people and really, really. I don't know, Twisted. In this case, there's a lot of things going on that are really, really cutting edge of reality, and people aren't willing to come to grips with allowing pe people freedom to see other realities. Well, this is the deal. Like, like I said, I've been in seven communities. Those communities, I was asked to come for what I do. Um, in the event things didn't work out, you know, I left. Um, and a lot of times I left in, in, in scenarios. And... Um, when, he's, when he was on land, they were building a community, and the men and wanted, acted like, you know, they were talking and wanted to have, you know, uh, biofuel and, you know, fertilizer stuff, and... It didn't and work. Careful. <laughs> Careful about giving too much information on the radio, please. <laughs> mentally and emotionally uh, for no reason. So um, this is kind of the stuff that happens is you end up on these communities and they ask you to come there. They're going to pay you for your time. Um, so I don't do a lot of community stuff anymore. And I do things like I'll go to the land and do like um, I'm working with seed movement tea. So, I'll go to second. Uh-oh. Hold on. Can you hold on a second? Yeah. Um, it has a lot to do with hierarchies. In the communities that I've dealt with, the people who are involved in the hierarchies 
tend to not want to listen to people that they consider to be not as important in the scheme of things. But each of us as an individual is totally important in the scheme of things. And I've found that people in trust positions are not worth trusting. And that my ability to trust them in the position that they were in caused great angst when I found out later that what they did was wrong and they didn't knew it and didn't care because the culture rewards them for getting the job done and not for trotting on their employees or staff in the process. So it's a lot about reward systems that don't work in community. system i mean you should you know be excited about your own initiative and not really have like a reward system um kind of a thing your um, work should not be tied yeah so the thing is, is like in communities like i've been seriously abused i've been probably more abused yeah i saw it here than i've been um, then I have just, you know, standing alone and doing my own thing in my own life. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is we're not going to be able to get things done communities in the future. And I've worked on one for 17 years. And hopefully, I'm hoping um, funding will finally come through so I can build that community uh, surrounded by biodynamic farming. And we'll be doing eight uh, combat veterans uh, for two-year programs, apprenticeships. So my land will not be a place where we'll be able to come and have community. Um, they will be specially selected through uh, the Veterans Coalition <coughs> to specifically learn off the grid living um, power and specifically think you know, biodynamic farming. Um, well, I see what, so what, what they need to do is they need to really start bringing out the technologies that are uh, that are useful for that, like HHO gas and, uh, you know, magnetic generators and you know, there, there are ways for people to get energy to fuel those systems that are free, or at least part free. You know, maybe it, maybe it takes a little bit of work, but there are technologies out there that can help with that. Yeah, but I'm, uh, you know, based on my whole thing, um, my project, I don't really, I won't really be needing any of that stuff. Um, because, I mean, it's a large-scale restoration. Everything we do is, like, hands-on. Um, Bridget? You know, one of the words... Of, Your sound is breaking up on this end. Uses, um, yeah, I don't know why. I think maybe if you drop out of the chat room and come back in, that might help. Yeah, because it's, it's really resonating bad right now. And this is the new way on Steampunk Radio with two E's, which you can find on your TuneIn app. You're listening to the new way, which runs Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock Eastern, uh, 7 o'clock Pacific Time, uh, 3 o'clock in London, 4 o'clock in Belgium. And so we're talking with Bridget Lynn Dolgoff and Twisted Wizard, who's usually here on Fridays, has popped in. And uh, it's been a good conversation. We're talking about people taking responsibility for their own sovereignty and building a framework for the life they wish to lead. And we all have to do things 
from a different standpoint of the framework we find ourselves in. Um, Bridget, have you gotten it fixed at all? I don't know. We're losing our guest here now that there's five minutes in the show left. Um, it's been a very interesting show again. Thank you much, yeah. Bridget. Do we have her here? I, I I can see that she's mic'd in, but I don't see anybody there, and I'm not getting any audio. Uh, yeah, I don't hear her either. So, it's interesting at the level of community that you're talking about with the Ubuntu movement and contributionism has gotten to a different level than where I'm working on human scale. And the way I've found it from working in different communities and with different people, I like the place I'm at, and we weren't really trying to build community. And that was a misconception on my part when I got here because I was more interested in being a hermit outside of the system been working with a lot of people, and a lot of that came from trying to bring myself back into a reality that I came back into after, I came back in in 2014 after having lived in the woods and lived alone for a few years, but been on a whole journey to get there to the alone state. And in building things back up, I have set certain metrics for myself in the game. And Bridget really is a wizard in a whole nother sense. And her shamanism and her understanding of how her world works is pretty darn awesome. But it's not the world that most people live in. And I only can walk there with a guide like her. I don't get there very often. So when she can get deep into talking, I let her go because I want to hear what she has to say. And if I interrupt her too much and get her distracted, I don't get the ends of stories that she started. So she really does work in awesome ways. And I'm going to see if I can't take the dialogue we got from today's radio show and turn it into a crypto fiction short story that sort of goes out to try and get the world in touch with our little world. But our little world through steampunk radio doesn't necessarily get out there into the big world. And it reminds me of when the Saturday Night Live cast was called the Not Quite Ready for Primetime Players. And it was one of those things that I, I got the joke. But they were on TV, but they, they were nobodies who just were funny. And that's what I think we're building here with our radio show are groups of people who have the capability of spreading information through a networking that they're not going to expect because it's totally decentralized and each of us have sovereignty to work through the system. But now that the game that I was scoring is over and we can play the show more from not the character role. I find that the character role that I got into within the show that may have caused some of the dynamics of the show to change through the period of the show. But I had to see how an entire show would go from beginning to end in 64 steps of equivalent size, shape, and form because as an experimenter, 
the statistical significance of data doesn't really kick in at low numbers. And if we had a 64 grid filled, like the one they use in the NC2A March Madness tournament, and by the way, take March Madness as a theme and step back and look at the world as they're showing it to us, and I can see what the deep state's been up to throwing this one out for years and years and years. It's because if you look at the real world, it is truly a March Madness right now, but everybody thinks when you use the term, you must be talking about basketball. Pretty silly. Pretty yeah, silly. So, Twisted, you're up for tomorrow and playing music? Oh, yeah. Good. I had talked to Ragamuffin, and he's up for playing music. And I think what we're going to do is just let you guys go back and forth with a length one key so that when you post a song, he gets to post the next one. And when his song is on, you can post your next one and go back and forth. And... All right. I'll let you start the show with the bumper music, and he'll respond to that. All right. We had a good turnout for that last week. We had an excellent turnout, and it turned out to be a very excellent show as soon as I stopped stressing and just rolled with it. But I had lost control because of the way the key worked, and I now have it down as to how to get it working so I don't have to be in the middle. What I can do is go on at the very beginning, give the introduction, cue up the bumper music, and that'll be game on. And if we get there half an hour early and talk between you and me and Ragamuffin, should not be any problem. And now we've told the listeners what to expect for tomorrow. I want to really try and maybe work on uh, maybe doing like a small little adventure since we know the Tatsumaki bot has a dice roller. We got to work on uh, an adventure or something one of these Fridays. Yes, we should. And maybe we should have it on a Saturday and do it off air as an experiment one time to see how it works. Because I've tried some things on air during the show to get the experience of doing it. But now that I'm no longer urgently in force on the show under those rules and strictures, I want to make sure that the show, well... It might be fun having an adventure on the show, but we'd have to, we'd have to get the rules down before we tried to go into it. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think, actually, what, what we should do is we should we should try and stick with, like, a, a D&D 3.5 rule system because it's one of the easiest to follow. I don't think that most of our listeners would understand what that meant, but Dennis and I have also talked about making r- game day Wednesdays. And so there's definitely some room to do some of this stuff. And if we play act it and it doesn't work, we just slip into something else. Sounds good to me. And we're off air. Yeah. 